Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Um, I wanted to give you all an update, too. Last weekend, we had our youth retreat, um, and it was great. Terry was there, and Adam, and many of our students. And, uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun. Um, we had an encounter with an armadillo, and uh, we may or may not have had a student impersonate an armadillo and, and try to scare some other uh, people in their cabin. He got a little wet, I think. Um, so, but uh, it was a great time together. Um, and uh, I, I felt like our group really came together um, and, and really had a great fellowship with each other. And that was cool to see. And um, I was really blessed by what some of the speakers had to share. Um, and I think our students were too. And um, so thank you for your prayers for us for that youth retreat and those that supported us financially. Um, it, was, it was really a, a great time there together. Well, as Tony said, we're going to continue in our final message today on seeking God's kingdom. And as Tony, I think, mentioned a week or two ago, it's really been a blessing for us just to dive into this and what a vast subject and important subject, critical in God's word. And it's just kind of a reminder before we jump into scripture, the kingdom of God concerns the bigger picture of what the Lord is doing over the course of history. And the kingdom is really the focus of the overarching narrative of Scripture, and it's centered in, on and in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So without Jesus, there is no, there is no kingdom. And Patrick Schreiner uh, says this about the kingdom of God. The kingdom is not simply social ethics or heaven or the church or God's sovereignty. The kingdom is much larger. Only when we connect the dots from the first page of the Bible to the last do we begin to see that on every page the kingdom concerns the king, his people, and their place. And at the center of this kingdom plan stands a wooden cross covered in blood. We're going to speak more about that cross and the connection to the kingdom in just a minute. But um, over the last several weeks, I just wanted to remind you that we've studied multiple aspects of this kingdom. Uh, the necessity to be born again, to see the kingdom, and to enter the kingdom. We looked at the call of Jesus to seek first the kingdom. We looked at our mission to share the gospel and to make disciples of all people who are brought into the kingdom of God. We looked at the importance of humility in order to inherit and experience the kingdom. We looked at the ministry of the Holy Spirit empowering us within to live in the kingdom with love at the center of our motivation. We looked at the example of Jesus, our King, whom we follow. And then last week, Tony looked at the ministry of reconciliation that brings us into right relationship with our King forever. And if you remember, and, and when we did the Lord's Supper at communion last week, there's this look ahead, even as Jesus is, is doing the Last Supper, to what is to come. And that is the focus that we want to take today. And I want to ask this question, how does it all end? How does this kingdom we've talked about come to a conclusion? The kingdom of God is very much a reality that one day will be fully realized. It's not simply this concept or some kind of a spiritual platitude or a guide for successful living. The kingdom is ruled by an all-powerful, all-knowing king whose people will worship him in a very real place. And that is the testimony of God's word. This kingdom is coming. And for now, we live by faith, don't we? Because we can't see God literally. And so that's when we spoke about, in some sense, the kingdom is invisible for now. As we await the coming kingdom that will be consummated, that will be fully realized and known and experienced. And on that day, when that happens, Scripture says we will literally see Jesus face to face. That's a pretty stunning thought to know that that is coming one day. And that should be the longing of our heart. In John, at the end of Revelation, he wrote, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Like, that's the end of the Bible. And so there's this longing in our heart 
to see this kingdom come. Horatio Spafford wrote this in a hymn I know many of you know. And Lord, haste the day when my face shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. So there'll be a day when we experience the reality of God's kingdom in all of its fullness. And until then, we have this promise in God's word that we find this reality of the kingdom proclaimed. And so today, I want to look with you into God's word in the book of Revelation. where We find the end of the story, the answer to this question, how does it all end? And in the introduction of the book of Revelation, the Apostle John wrote these words in Revelation chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. And I just want to share with you guys what a beautiful thing it is that we have this promise that as we read from the scripture here and we hear it and we keep the words, there's a promise we're going to be blessed. And so that's my prayer for you guys today and for myself. And um, I want to go to the Lord now in, in prayer as, as we prepare for that. Father, we thank you for this promise. We thank you that you give us this blessing as we study your word in the book of Revelation and we know any part of your scripture. And Lord, as it's already been asked, we ask for you to speak to us, speak to our hearts, open our eyes, help us to understand and, and clearly understand what you want to share with us today, Lord. We just ask most of all for the sweet presence of your spirit with us, Lord. We ask for uh, just your work and and just the, the evidence in our heart, Lord, that you would bear witness with our spirit that we know you, Lord. And if anyone here today does not have that witness, I pray that they would walk away here putting their faith in you and Jesus as their king. And we pray this in your name. Amen. So the title of today's message is Worthy is the Lamb. And our text is Revelation chapter 5. So you can be turning there if you have your Bible. We'll have the words on the screen here as well. And in this passage, we find the reality of God's kingdom proclaimed as John describes this vision he received while he was in the spirit as an exile on the island of Patmos. And so let's look now at Revelation 5. We're just going to read through the scripture together. And this is one of those places that's just all inspiring, I believe, in, in the Bible. Verse 1, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent, into, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. 
Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands sang with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and, as su- and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And then the four living creatures said, amen. And the four elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. How about y'all? There's, there's maybe not a whole lot I can add to that. <laughs> That's a pretty powerful part of Scripture. Um, But I'm going to try and and just shed some light on some things. And and the main thing I want to share with you guys is that Jesus is worthy of worship as the king whose kingdom prevails by his redeeming sacrifice. And we see that he is the lion and the lamb whose people, us, will reign with him on the earth forever. And he is the one who is worthy. That's if you can take away one thing today. He is the one who is worthy. But until John came to that realization that Jesus was the one that the angel's talking about, do you notice he was really distressed, like really upset? Look back with me at the first four four verses here. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. And so... What I want you guys to see, and and there's maybe multiple things to see there, but I believe this is saying that the world is broken and without hope apart from the one who is worthy. Because of that brokenness, there's this issue. There's no small problem. And John is left weeping in verse 4. And you might think, well, isn't that kind of overreacting, John? Like, why, why are you... Why are you weeping about the fact that someone can't open a scroll? Well, I think the context here is really important to understand. Why would he react that way? And in the previous chapter, which we actually just sang about, and Tony, you were reading from chapter 4 from that scripture. In this previous chapter, we learned that John was invited into the throne room of heaven, which he entered in the Spirit. And once he was there, he experienced the glory and the majesty of God in his very presence where he is continually worshipped. And now in chapter 5, God is on his throne and he's holding the scroll in his right hand. And the description of the scroll having writing on both sides and these seven seals in the ancient world, in John's time, they would have understood this was a significant sort of official document. If it had those seals and the writing on the outside would have been a summary of sort of the language on the inside. And so in the ancient world, this was an important document. And of course, it's heightened all the more by the fact that God on his throne is holding this scroll. It's like something is to be revealed, right? Something is to be done. And so the fact that it can't be opened has caused John this great grief. And he's intensely aware this is no ordinary scroll. In verse 2, a strong angel is seeking a person who is worthy to open and loose its seals. And we learn in the next chapter of Revelation, in chapter 6, that the opening of these seals initiates the judgment of God. When God brings judgment and he righteously judges the world, and until that happens... The brokenness, the injustice, the sin, the suffering of the world will continue. And it seems that John's weeping points to this longing for the full realization of God's kingdom. 
And he knows that God must judge before that realization can happen. Jesus himself had taught John, remember, and the other disciples to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So John knew they were waiting for that to fully happen. In his letter to the Romans, the apostle Paul speaks of this longing for the kingdom. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting, waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Now, that's a lot of theological language there. I just kind of want to sum that up for you, that Paul is saying there is something not right. There's something wrong, and and we feel it within us, and we see it in the world around us. But we're not without hope. It's not something we can fix. But Paul knows there's this glorious day coming where God fixes it, and he makes things right. There's a song, Is He Worthy?, by Andrew Peterson and Ben Shive. And the lyrics speak to the brokenness of our world in a powerful way by raising a series of questions. I want to just read some of these to you. It says, do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst. I love those words. I love those questions. And if you hear the song, the choir is responding to those questions that that are raised. And I wonder if you guys identify with any of those questions today in, in your own life. Is there a longing in your heart for the light of the Lord to put an end once and for all to the darkness of sin and death? I was driving down the road the other day and you guys may think this is a silly thing, but it, it really struck me, I, and, and forgive me if it is, but I was driving on the road, and I was taking Hannah to school, and there was this uh, dead animal, and there was a bunch of vultures all around this, this dead animal, and I was driving down the road, and I kind of had to hit the brakes, right, and they went everywhere. I was afraid I was going to have a vulture in my windshield, and uh, you guys have probably had that before. And so I I drove on to school and I came back that way after I dropped Hannah off. And one of those vultures, guess what? It was flat on the road and its wing was like sticking up. And I thought, what a picture, right? Death breeds death, right? These these vultures and this animal has died. And then the the vulture itself is dead. and, And I don't know, maybe I'm weird, but to me it was like, this can't be right, right? There's something wrong here with all of this death that we even see in the animal kingdom around us, much less what we experience with people. And so it hit me just once again, this longing to see creation restored. And so as we think about this today, do we see our need for one who is worthy? Do we see that longing in our heart for Jesus. I think sometimes we feel overwhelmed by the negative things in the world and by the grief and maybe a loss of a loved one or just health issues or whatever you're going through. We've had so many people around here sick. It can be really discouraging and we sort of lose sight of the fact of what we're going to see in just a minute that there is one who is worthy that's going to restore all these things and the kingdom is going to become reality. Sometimes we're on the opposite end of that spectrum, right? We're kind of just going through life. It seems good. Seems like we're living, a, having a positive experience. Maybe things are going right. Maybe especially when we're young, all this heartache seems kind of foreign, right? You just want to look ahead and live your life. 
But it's important to remember everything is not right. And we do need Jesus who is worthy. So that brings us to Revelation 5.5, 5, where John receives some very welcome news. Okay, he learns he can stop weeping. He can stop crying. Look with me in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And so when we look at that portion of this scripture, I want you to see that by Christ's power and through his sacrifice, Jesus is worthy to reign victoriously with his people over God's kingdom. He is the king of the kingdom. In verse 5, John is told that the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. So what do those terms mean there? The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Well, those titles specifically refer to Jesus as the Messiah based on Old Testament prophecies in Genesis 49 when um, Jacob is dying or Israel and he's prophesying about his sons and in Isaiah chapter 11 when the prophet is prophesying about the Messiah. And so it's rooted in the Old Testament scripture. And these scriptures speak of the Messiah the promised one being born into the tribe of Judah as a descendant of King David. Remember, David is the one who God promised to establish his throne forever. And so these are messianic titles of Jesus. And the image of the lion speaks of Christ's power and his might as a king. The strength of, of a lion. But and in verse 6, do you guys notice when John looks to God's throne, he sees standing a lamb as though it had been slain. So there's this stunning contrast. Do you see that? The this, this strength of a lion. And yet when he looks at the throne, what does he see? He sees a lamb. The lamb, just like the lion, is very much an image of Jesus. In fact, the lamb is repeatedly the title that Jesus is referred to over and over in the book of Revelation, even as he is conquering God's enemies. And if you remember, even in the gospel of John, what did the, John the Baptist, he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus is this lamb. And the picture in verse six is of a Passover lamb sacrificed by the Israelites while they were slaves in Egypt. And if you remember, the Lord commanded them to place the blood of that Passover lamb on the doorpost of the frame of their, the door frames of their homes so that God would pass over and spare the life of their firstborn sons during the final plague that God enacted on Egypt. And it was through that Passover that God freed his chosen people from slavery. Finally, each, uh, a Pharaoh let them go. And remember, they went into the, into the wilderness and they went through the Red Sea. And this is the moment of salvation in the Old Testament where God did this Passover. It was through the Passover they were freed and his chosen people were freed from slavery. And the sacrifice lamb in the Passover was in essence a sign that pointed forward to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. And Jesus willingly died on the cross 
as a sinless lamb of God, the sinless lamb of God, to forgive our sins and free us from the bondage of death. So in essence, he took the punishment we deserved so that we could be forgiven and receive eternal life. And here lies the astounding truth that this passage is communicating. I want you guys to hear me on this. By his death, Jesus prevails. Do you guys understand that? By his death, Jesus prevails. Yes, he rose again. He's alive. He is a living lamb. He's not dead. Don't hear me wrong. But by his death, Jesus prevails, and he wins the victory over sin, over death, over Satan. I think the enemy thought when Jesus is dying on that cross, this is it. I've killed him. I've gotten rid of him. And it was that very thing that won the victory. And notice the lamb in verse 6, it has seven horns. And in scripture, these horns speak of power and authority. And he has seven eyes. That sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? A lamb having seven eyes? What does that mean? Well, that speaks of vision and being able to see all things. Remember, this is a vision. There's symbolism here. And it speaks of the seven spirits of God. That is seemingly a reference to the Holy Spirit who is sent out from God to all the world. And this lamb in the midst of God's throne with this symbolism, he is the one who is omnipotent, meaning all powerful. And he's omniscient. He's all knowing. And he's the king. And that theme of the lamb being all powerful and all knowing and the king, and this is important, who is one with God. He's one with the Father. That theme is carried out throughout this book of Revelation. In verse 7, the lamb takes the scroll from God. He's worthy. And then in verse 8, the living creatures and the elders fall down before him in worship. And there's harps. Now, these harps are more like what we would call a, a lyre, L-Y-R-E. Um, it's a stringed instrument. And incense. And these instruments and this incense would have been familiar to the Jewish people as elements of worship in the temple or in the tabernacle. And so you've got this picture of Jesus being God worshiped in the heavenly temple. And this worship anticipates victory. Grant Osborne says this, the lamb is about to inaugurate the event that will dissolve the present order and institute the final kingdom and glorious reign of God. And that is the theme of the new song that begins in verse 9. Jesus is declared to be the one who is worthy, again, notice, on the basis of his sacrificial death. He's the one who was slain. By his blood, he redeems God's people. So what does redeem mean? That, that's sort of a biblical term that maybe we're not as familiar with. Well, Grant Osborne says the Greek word translated redeemed here can be translated purchased. And it carries the idea of a ransom payment that frees a prisoner of war from bondage. And so there's this sense here that Jesus has taken possession of us, those who believe in him, so that we can reign with him as kings and, and, and as priests. And so there's this amazing thing. It's like taking us from slavery. And in a sense, we are God's possession. But that means something incredible happens. We become adopted into his royal family. And notice he redeems people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. That means God's purpose is for people from all over the earth to come to know him. And every country and every nation, not just the United States, not just from wherever you're from, every person created in his image, God's heart, as Tony talked about so much last week, is for them to be reconciled to God and to know him and to spend eternity with him. That's the great commission. That's why Jesus would go into all the world and make disciples and teach them all that I've commanded you and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so in Revelation 5, 5 verse 10, we have this remarkable statement about God's kingdom. We, his people, will reign on the earth with Jesus as kings and priests. 
And the essence of this here is that he restores what Adam and Eve lost in the garden. Remember, they were told to take dominion and to, and, to, and to tend the garden and Adam's name of the animals. Before sin came in, they were these sort of vice regents, these people that God had given this dominion to. And when sin came in, the curse came in. And all of a sudden there was this opposition, there was a struggle to work, there was ch pain and childbirth, and there was something messed up. And so when we're spoken of as reigning with God, there's this picture of the created order being restored. And we're given dominion, authority, not over God, we're under Christ, but we do have this authority in the creation. And as priests, the image there is direct access to God. Because what did a priest do? A priest went into the temple and ministered, and the high priest went in and went into the Holy of Holies. And so if we're called priests, that means we can have a relationship with God that has no barrier. And Tony spoke last week about the veil that's torn. The veil of the temple was torn when Jesus died. And so that's the picture here. All of a sudden, we have this access to the very presence of God. And I don't know if you guys have experienced that. I know many of you have. But if you experience God's presence in a personal way, there's nothing that, that matches that, that really trumps everything else. So when we think about how do we apply some of this, I mean, the first thing I want to say to you is the promise of God's kingdom, it puts so much in perspective. I mean, if we really believe what we're reading here, that we're going to reign with the Lord, that Jesus is this lion in the land, that he's won the victory. You know, when we go through difficult things in life or confusing things, perplexing things, man, there's a different perspective. Right? We have a peace that this is only temporary. What is real is what we don't see, but it's going to be really real one day. The other thing I want to point out to you is that the cross of Christ is central to the kingdom of God. Patrick Schreiner says this, Jesus was enthroned on the cross, and it is only through the cross that the kingdom comes. If there had been no blood on the tree, there would be no kingdom. If there had been no death of the Messiah, there would be no deliverance. As Augustine said, the Lord has established his sovereignty from a tree. Who is it who fights with wood? Christ. From his cross, he has conquered kings. The kingdom of God has been established through the cross of Christ by which Jesus' reign is irreversibly fixed on earth as it is in heaven. And you guys, when you think about when Jesus died on the cross, what was posted above that cross? Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And remember when they said, Pilate, you, you need to say he says he's the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. And so there's this amazing picture of Jesus as the king on the cross. Even on the cross, do you remember what he did? There was, there was one of the thieves. One of the thieves was mocking him next to him. And the other thief said, remember me, Lord, in your kingdom. There's the kingdom again. And so you have the king on the cross promising the kingdom. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So even on that cross, Jesus as the king is reconciling a man to himself. That's the picture here. And so there's this amazing love. Okay, don't miss the love. That the, the cross is in some ways God's love letter to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so when we think about this kingdom, it's not just a power structure. It's not just a, a thing that God accomplishes. It is a powerful, amazing thing. But ultimately, it is relational. We are priests and we're saved through the blood of his cross. Now, when that is reality in our hearts, that ought to do something to us, right? That ought to change the way we relate to God, we relate to the world. And so it's amazing how this chapter ends because you have this explosion of worship in the heavenly host, worshiping God and Jesus on the throne. Look with me again in Revelation 5, verse 11. 
Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven on the, and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And then the four living creatures said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. So the final point I want to make to you guys is that worship of the Lord is the central focus of God's kingdom. That's the focus. And that's the heart, honestly, we want it to be the heart of our church. If, if you go on our website and, and you hear Tony share about what are we about? Well, worship is right there, right? And I think that, that aligns with what scripture says. What an amazing scene that John encounters here. In verse 11, the language here speaks of an innumerable multitude of angels. You can't even count them. You notice all the numbers, thousands and thousands, and it's like you can't even count them. And they have this loud voice, and they're, they're praising the Lord, the Lamb. And they're gathered to praise the one who is worthy. He's called again the Lamb who was slain. And again, the sacrifice of the cross is in view once more. Do you see that over and over? It's not forgotten. He is worthy, they say, to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. And then in verse 13, there's this sense of the whole dominion of God's kingdom. It talks about every creature, everywhere, anywhere you could describe is worshiping the Lord. Now that's interesting. We know that ultimately those who reject Christ will be separated from him. They face judgment and condemnation. But there will be at least at one point, every knee bowing to Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said to the Philippians. And so here you see this picture of all of creation worshiping the Lord. And then in verse 14, the living creatures and the elders, they once again fall down to worship their living eternal Lord. And, and when you use this, see this language, fall down means they're literally going to the floor, right? That's what the, the language means. And they keep doing this over and over because the Lord is so holy. So for those of us in Christ, we will one day experience this glorious worship in the kingdom of God in the very presence of Jesus. And he's surely worthy of our worship. I want to close today by sharing with you just a, a, a last word from Revelation of what it means what will happen when we, we meet Jesus. In Revelation 22, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was a tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There's the restoring of creation. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Lord, we thank you for that promise today. We're in awe, Lord, of, of what you've done and the power of your cross, the reality of your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that there was no other way. And Jesus, you chose to go to the cross and give your life because you loved us, because you loved your Father and obeyed him. And Lord, we just want to tell you today with these angels, with these elders, with these living creatures, you are worthy of worship. You are the lamb who is worthy. 
And Lord, we thank you for that. And we pray, Lord, that if anyone here today does not know you, does not know for sure in their heart, they will see you face to face and have your name written on their forehead and experience this light that destroys all darkness forever. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would give them the faith to believe today and work in their heart and open their eyes and their understanding to believe and to simply confess you as Lord, to believe in their heart that you've raised Father Jesus from the dead, to confess you as Lord and to receive your forgiveness by faith. And Lord, now as we, we have this opportunity to worship once again, uh, we pray that you would just be blessed by our praise and our worship. In Jesus' name, amen.